Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show where we discuss short video games. You know, the kind of things you can play in an evening or a weekend on your iPad, on your console, on your computer, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as it is relatively short in duration and does something new and interesting. Uh, I'm your host, Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined this week by my two awesome co-hosts, Laura Nash. How are you doing, Laura? I'm doing terrific. And Nate Heininger. How are you doing, Nate? I'm well. Glad to be here. And this uh, week... Don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> ready to uh, be confused about an awesome game. Well, Nate, let me let me enlighten you. This week we are talking about her story. Um, surprise! Surprise! Yeah. No, seriously, this game, I, I'm super thrilled to talk about this show, and I'm really excited about this episode because I think it may be one of our most interesting so far. So um, before we talk too much about the game, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a different structure this week in that I was able to arrange an interview with Sam Barlow, the developer of the game. So we're going to talk a little bit about of our, our brief, dis- you know, brief description of the game, and then we're going to play that interview in which I had a chat with Sam Barlow. And then we're going to come back after that interview to talk a little bit about our impressions and do our typical format. So this episode may run a little long. Um, bear with us a little bit, and uh, I think it's going to be really neat. If you haven't played her story... Um, it's one of the most interesting games I've played in a long time. Uh, I, I played this game kind of on a whim. I'd been following Sam on Twitter for a little while, and uh, he'd been tweeting about it for several months before it came out. And um, on the basis of those tweets and the sort of intrigue uh, inherent therein, I pre-ordered the game and uh, played it the very first day that it was available. And I have to say it was probably the most um, – it was the most surprising an interesting game experience I've had since Gone Home. And for people who might have been listening to this show for a while, you know I really loved that game, and it was one of the first things that made me want to start this podcast, and it was also the topic of our first episode. Maybe someday, now that we're actually decent at podcasting here, uh, we'll go back and re-explore that episode. And I think you just want to be a detective. You know, I think I do. I think I think exploring and solving mysteries, uh, it gets to something in me. Um, but... It's a really difficult game to describe, um, kind of like Gone Home in a way, in that it's it's if you describe the game to somebody, it doesn't necessarily make sense how it works as a game. Um, how would you guys explain her story? You are searching a police database of clips, and each search gives you little micro clips, usually under a minute, and from those pieces, you have to find out what happened to a woman over the course of a couple days of interrogation. Yeah, I guess the the there's very it's little more interesting than that sounds. Yeah, yeah there's very <laughs> little plot set up, but I from what I can tell is that the entirety of a police station's like records have been destroyed in a flood or something to that effect and you are in front of a, a terminal, your entire UI is just a terminal. And a very, all they very have left from looking terminal. Yeah, too. I mean, all of this. Well, I think it literally says like 94 to 96 or something. Yeah. All um, of the interviews take place in 1994. So, yeah, and I actually had 97 a, was flooded. They're not very similar um, as far as like the big picture. But I was feeling a little bit of true detective in this. Oh, if yeah. You guys are fans of that show. Uh, think of the interviews with Matthew McConaughey. Only just him and not the police side of it, like not where there you see the interrogators. Um, but basically, your job, as far as you can tell, is to figure out what happened based entirely on these clips. And it, the really unique thing about it is that they basically they say they had a stenographer who typed out every word that was said in each clip and attached it to that clip. So you can search through them by keywords. If she said the word bag in any moment of that video if you type the word bag into the keyword search it'll pull every single video that she said the word bag but you only get to watch the because of a very 90s limitation of the of the computer system that you're using you're limited to only the first five clips even if you search a word let's say you search the word um uh, murder or uh blood or body um you know, you might get two or three clips. Maybe she only uses that word a few times, but it might say, you know, 15 clips found, and then you only get to see the first five because that's the limitation of the system that you're using. It only shows you five clips at a time. So for, uh, so it, it naturally makes it harder to watch the later clips where the more juicy details of the story emerge. 
It is advanced enough, though, to accept multiple keywords or strings of keywords if you put them together. So you can search a sentence or um, different names together, and it'll only pull videos that those two names together. Uh, and that's when it gets a little bit deeper. Transcriptions are really helpful. I mean, I am always yelling at people to transcribe their videos. This is basically... Um, I wish I could hold this game up as the example to my clients. <laughs> well, this game, um, I mean, it's gotten a lot of buzz and uh, Sam Barlow has been doing a lot of press. It's actually been reviewed pretty widely. And also I was kind of interested that, uh, you know, we're a relatively small podcast. We don't get a lot of people writing into the show. Uh, we get some people writing in on Twitter and whatnot, but we actually had a lot of people reach out to us before this show even aired saying that they thought this show, this game would work for our show. And I'd like to read a quick, uh, description, a little bit of a quote from uh, one of our listeners uh, who asked that his name not be read on the air, um, who, who wrote in suggesting that we play this game. So thanks KW. Um, so he was also playing L.A. Noir at the same time. And actually, I, I really thought a lot of L.A. Noir as I was playing this game. L.A. Noir was a game that, for me personally, I, I thought that I would love it because it was an investigation game. It was a crime game. It was by developers that I knew and trusted. It had stars that I, I you know thought were great. And I didn't really end up liking it very much. And he was contrasting this a little bit with the investigation style in L.A. Noir. Uh, it's really rare to run a, come across a game that approaches crime at all, but even rarer are games that approach it from this talking to people and interview perspective, rather than from investigating a crime scene, like something like your, you know, Ace Attorney games or your Batman games or what have you. And what, uh, what KW wrote in was, discovery in her story is just much more gratifying and part of it than how L.A. Noir straight out tells you whether an item or a thread is useful or not uh, by musical cues or Phelps saying that something is useless. You also get scored based on whether you get an interaction in interrogation correct or not. So there's clearly a right answer. In her story, it's a very different feedback delivery system, and it incentivizes a much different kind of thinking than L.A. Noir. Uh, L.A. Noir also tended to have a fairly decisive conclusion to each of its cases, and that doesn't seem to be the case here. Well, so really, I think the big difference for me uh, personally between this and L.A. Noir uh, is that this is a game where all of the realizations, all of the uh, guesses and ideas about the plot, all the hints and clues, they're happening to you as the player, not to a detective that you are controlling with some joysticks. And it's not, when you're, in, when you're watching these interviews, it's not a complex menu system that is kind of layered on top of an interview where you're trying to you know, figure out the right choice on a, on a series of choices. You're actually really investigating. It feels more like an investigation than anything else I have ever played. If you're looking for a right or wrong answer, or you're looking for somebody to tell you you have the right theory, you've chosen the wrong game. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask you guys. So I think you guys, I played this game for uh, several hours, and I, I, I dug as deep as I could. But there is no win state in this game, right? It exactly, is, no, yeah. It there is, is a pure... credit rolls moment. Like, there is a moment where the credits roll, and you have quote-unquote completed the game. But it's based, as far as I can tell, only on how much of the content in the game you have seen. If you've seen more than maybe about 50% of it, it gives you an option to end the game, but um, it is up to you if that is the end. And really you play this game until you are satisfied with that, you know, satisfied that you know what happened and you feel like you know enough to stop. But no one will ever say like, yep, this is what happened in this order and this is who did it and how it was done. So I, I want to talk more about our um, about our impressions of the game and dive in. We'll also do a spoiler break and then dive in a little bit uh, about our theories on the plot, uh, which I would recommend leaving that post spoiler break segment till after you've given the game a shot. It's the whole game. It's yeah, yeah, more <laughs> or less. Um, but um, before we dive in any deeper, I want to go ahead and introduce Sam Barlow, the developer of the game. Um, so here's my interview recently with the developer, Sam Barlow. You've been on quite a press tour. Uh, I've seen 
interviews with you all over the place. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to come on our little podcast. That's cool. I think uh, I wasn't expecting this level of interest in the game. So it's uh, all very positive, particularly because I think we uh, the weekend before the game launched, there was all the news about Tale of Tales um, last game not having sold very oh, well. Yeah. And, and, you know, and a lot of people extrapolated that to say there was no kind of climate or there was no appetite for more interesting things and, and and a lot of blame was kind of placed on the steam audience and you know the kind of pc audience um but yeah i mean i you know when i was thinking about doing this and um kind of making the decision to move from working for publishers on, on kind of larger projects to going to do something myself you know a lot, a lot of the questions in my mind were you know can, can i afford to do this um and i kind of figured out that i could um, you know, run for a year um, with the support of my wife and what savings I had. And, you know, if I could make something interesting within that year um, and see if I could kind of break even, then then for me that would be a kind of a worthwhile exercise. And, you know, my expectations were that maybe over, say, six months, you know, I'd launch the game and, and like you say, the, the people that would be interested in this would maybe buy it Um and then there'd be kind of, you know, hopefully a bit of word of mouth. Those people would like it, but it certainly wouldn't be for everyone. And, you know, maybe over six months I could kind of break even on this thing and, and that would work out. But, um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm, I can pretend it was all planned. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you know, so, you know, the game launched the week after E3. So it kind of launched into a, a press vacuum, right, because all the big exciting news had, had already been um, – done with you know during that and it's not you know not that many games released during this period anyway so there was probably a a kind of you know there was some something of a vacuum within the games press and you know maybe having sat through the whole of e3 your kind of average uh, video game journalist or video game fan is is maybe kind of uh, overwhelmed by all the big explosive blockbuster stuff Um, and so you know the time was ripe for something interesting to kind of come along but um yeah i mean i think you know it's it was always my aim to make something that was accessible um and i kind of planned to aims to launch on both the kind of app store and um, on pcs and macs because i felt like i wanted to give myself the biggest chance to find that audience somewhere um and yeah knowing that you know the core interface was not traditional game one um and that although although the game is on one level, quite an experimental narrative thing. It also the the kind of the the sort of framing and the setting justifies that and explains it and and is very easy for people to understand. You know, my mum can Google on her iPad. She knows how to do that. You know, she mm-hmm. and, and that's actually now part of her life is 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 googling for things, finding um, stuff on the internet. And, you know, everyone has that kind of as a reflex action almost now, you know, you meet a new person or you get a new colleague at work. You first thing you do is Google them. You know, it's, you're going to go to a party somewhere, you Google for the directions, whatever it's, it's, it's such a kind of intuitive thing. And, and I kind of had that in my head as being an interesting part of, of this project. Um, and I guess that did, um, probably help more than I thought in terms of making this something which could have a kind of wider appeal. Uh, the the structure is really unique. The um, the FMV presentation though is probably the thing that that stands out most when you're first looking at the game on a Steam page or something like that. Uh, is is that something that you intended from the very beginning to work with a live actor, or was that something that uh, came in later as you were trying to figure out how to tell your story? It was something that I knew I was going to do once I kind of gave myself the go ahead to make the game. Um, but in terms of kind of trying to come up with the idea, so, you know, I was coming up with lots and lots of ideas when once I decided to make this independent project I was coming up with lots and lots of ideas but I was a fairly harsh critic of myself because I knew how competitive the the kind of you know the market is now and that if this thing was going to work digitally it would need to kind of stand for itself and it would need to be something that would get people's attention so I was thinking of lots and lots of ideas and um, I was trying to think of ideas that were in the kind of police procedural space, crime space, because it's, it's something I've pitched lots before to traditional publishers. It's something that kind of maddens me is when you look at other media, how you know so much of it is in this kind of space, in this genre, whether it's books, films, TV, 
um, because it, it's a genre that works so well. You know, it's the, the kind of traditional detective story is is a complex story. You have multiple time frames, unreliable characters, you know, very character driven, very psychological. Um, and then, you know, the issues you're dealing with in, in crime fiction, detective fiction are very much the hot button topics of uh, the society you're in. You know, we are dealing with what counts as a crime, you know, the differences between good and evil. We're talking about how you actually punish things. All these social issues come into play. So it's, you know, it's such a fertile space. It always frustrated me that, that video games have always kind of, you know, shied away from it, um, apart from a few kind of notable examples. So I was I was trying to come up with something in that space, and I knew that was something I wanted to do. But the idea of the database, the idea of using real video, was something that kind of just popped into my head. And you know, obviously, my subconscious was beavering away, hmm. um, putting the pieces together, and thinking about this. And, and I can kind of trace that inspiration back. But yeah, that idea kind of popped into my head. So at that point that's when I felt confident that here was an idea that I could kind of fall in love with. Here was something that could work. Cause like you say, you know, it had a unique aesthetic because yeah, you're browsing a store page or looking at your news of video game news, or even, you know, someone who doesn't like video games is leafing through their newspaper and they get to the video game page and, and there on the page is actually a photo of a real woman sat in a police interview room. That, felt to me like, yes, there's, there's going to be something that's going to stand out there from the aesthetic. Um, the genre we're in is going to help things stand out. And it felt like the mechanic was an interesting thing that would be, you know, simple but deep, which is, you know, the, the kind of ideal people always have. So I think it, the idea to me felt like this is something that if I give it my best shot, you know, is as good as an idea as I can come up with. Well, the mechanic is really unique, but it's also kind of a big risk. Um, I mean, it's a, it kind of precludes, it kind of prevents you from doing any sort of traditional narrative structure. You know, there's, there's no like three acts to this game. You're basically handing over complete control of the plot and, you know, the way the story is being told to your audience. How do you prevent that from going off the rails? How do you prevent somebody from First of all, how, how do you save that narrative from, from your players? Is that something you ran into when testing? Um, I think it, it was during the writing process that I think most of the headbanging occurred. No, I mean, I've always had an interest in uh, kind of less conventional storytelling, right? So mm-hmm. all the kind of the, the, the beat guys and the surrealists and Burroughs firing shotguns into his novels and, and chopping things up and J.G. Ballard writing things down on playing cards and mixing them up. Um, so, you know, that's, that's always been something that I've been interested in. Um, and I guess, but there's, there, there is the issue there of it not being something that is, uh, necessarily suitable for, for kind of mass consumption. It's an acquired taste, right? Um, but here was a way of having some of the things that are cool about that, but having this layer of connective tissue and, and having this this interactivity which gave you some ability to kind of have control over that. Um, and one of the things that really set me down this direction was because I think when I first started thinking of the game and I had, you know, the basic ideas, the database, the video, the interview room, I think very early uh, early on, in my head, I was still very much in the space of the detective and it was very much... This is a game about solving a crime, uh, determining the truth, and you know that's that's the arc of the game. And what I did then was went away and did lots of research, and so I was kind of you know reading all the police manuals and bits and pieces. But also I was watching a lot of real life footage taken from interviews, um, and that really shifted my kind of perspective because I stopped feeling like I was the detective, and and because you know, a, lot, a lot of this was motivated by the kind of guilt you feel watching this stuff kind of being this uh, voyeuristic uh, interloper into these very intimate interviews. Um, I very much shifted my perspective to being in the in the seat with the person who is being interviewed or interrogated and, and empathizing towards them. And that kind of shifted gears for me so that it stopped being about the crime and the solution and became much more about hearing the story of this person who was sat in the interview chair. And that, that, to some extent, took some of the danger out of kind of shortcutting the, the solution that, um, of the crime. But as well, it, 
it meant that the story I was looking at suddenly became much more layered. So it wasn't just about this one thing of what happened with this crime. It became about this woman's life and the events leading up to that and various aspects of her life and other people in her life. And so what naturally emerged from that was that because there were so many layers to the narrative, it was that much harder for players to kind of shortcut things because they might discover, um, you know, the end, they might discover what you might call the end of the story um, very early on before they discovered the beginning of the story. Um, But that would only be one part of the story. Um, And actually in discovering that they might then, want to uncover more things to do with that or that might then reflect on another aspect or another subplot within the story um and i kept i kept coming back to i can't remember who said this but um so someone pointed this out in, in trying to encourage writers to um self-edit and cut and um explaining the maxim that you should always start a story as late as possible um, they gave the example that how many times, and obviously this doesn't happen anymore because we have Netflix, but how many times have you turned on the TV halfway through a show and watched an episode of something and, and not been lost? You've picked up what's happened. You pick up the story, right? You can turn, turn on any kind of primetime um, mystery show or soap opera or drama, start halfway through, and very rapidly your brain picks up what the story is and fills in the blanks um, and you don't necessarily feel lost. Um, and that kind of thinking was very much in my mind that, you know, I think there is a, you can throw a lot at an audience and you can ask a lot of an audience in terms of putting things together. And I think they will kind of rise to the challenge and, and it becomes more enjoyable because now your brain is directly engaged in it. That, that seems almost like a theme for you because like uh, the earliest thing of yours that I've played and I, I think probably the thing that you kind of first became known for was some of your uh, interactive fiction, specifically Isle, which actually going back, uh, I, I didn't put it together when I was playing her story, but I had played Isle um, a long time back. And our show covers a lot of interactive fiction, or at least we try to. Is this kind of a return to your interactive fiction roots? Because you seem to, you know, you did Isle and and uh, then you moved on to more uh, mainstream game development, like with the Silent Hill game. I think there's definitely, it picks up on, things that I love about interactive fiction. Um, so I've always been uh, just in love with the idea of the text the text game and, and the kind of command prompt. I, I love the idea of the blinking cursor and the game saying, type anything. You know, and, and that was always the promise in the olden days of a, of a text game was let your imagination run wild, type anything. Um, now, obviously, the the reality of that is that there's very little you can type that the game will understand in those classic games. Um, but where those games do work, and you know some of the best examples, there are these lovely moments where you imagine something and you conjure something up and you type it and it works. And, and there's something definitely magical to me about that is, is this almost sense of incantation where you're typing in words you know, you've got ideas in your brain which you then express as a word. You type it into the computer, and then you get this response, and the fiction kind of uh, reacts to to this thing that you've imagined. That always felt very magical to me. And some of the the kind of highlights of the kind of text game canon to me are moments where that happens, um, where you kind of just you know imagine things or you think outside the box and and then communicate through words. That's always felt very cool, and just the there's something just so wonderful about interacting with a computer through words rather than, you know, a, a joystick to push a character around is such a kind of removed process. You're just piloting this kind of human slash vehicle. It's very hard to have any nuance. You know, when you're typing words, you, you can almost um, add an element of kind of nuance and there's, there's a lot more kind of richness, it feels like, to, to what you're doing. I've seen a lot of uh, interactive fiction try new things with sort of narrative structures in games that you see, you know, years later coming up in, uh, uh, in more mainstream games. So it seems like sort of a, a test bed for coming up with new ways to play with narrative in games. You could easily prototype her story using interactive fiction tools, um, but it's giving you so much more because of the video and the, the actress's performance. I mean, I had um, I had a prototype of it that was just text. Um, once I had uh, kind of the first draft of the the various dialogues, um, but I refused to show that to anyone because although it was useful for me to kind of play it and pretend to be playing it, 
it really felt like the the kind of video was going to add something to it, just in terms of the pacing, the difference between listening to someone talk versus reading the words on the page. Um, that that felt like that's such a, a key part of it. But yeah, I think it 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 definitely ties into that kind of tradition of interactive fiction. Um, and you know, you see now there's such a movement towards choice based um, interactive fiction, which is completely fine that's there's nothing wrong with that but i think there's still something to be done with the kind of text input so when this idea kind of sprung into my head you know the more i thought about it the more i loved it because it was a way of using text but all of the frustrations of text input were part of the experience you know if um and and also tied directly into the idea of detective work so you know if you were typing words in and getting nothing back actually this felt like this felt like progress because this felt like a detective running down his leads it, you know it felt like that sense of struggling and trying to uncover something it felt like that element of kind of effort and frustration in this instance would actually add to the kind of atmosphere no i know just what you mean my notes for this when i was playing this game i was taking you know copious notes in a little uh, notebook and and almost all of it is just seemingly random words scribbled and then crossed out as i was going through it and it really um it gave this feeling of being a detective much more than any game that I've ever uh, seen in the sort of crime or investigation genre. Uh, it's, yep. you know, more than something like your, you know, um, ace attorneys or your, they so often focus on investigating the scene of the crime rather than on this, uh, on the interview after the fact. I mean, I think I, I've, yeah, I've, I've always loved games that have tried to do kind of conversation mechanics using words so you know you think back to like the old ultima games where you're typing keywords and there were games like um so douglas adams game starship titanic used a kind of keyword search thing and there's a company called synapse i think they're called synapse who who had a kind of interactive fiction parser based more around keywords and i always that stuff always appealed to me because it it felt more fluid and um, less rigid and robotic than your kind of traditional passes, but but it would always fall down because it was having to translate that into some in-world action or some kind of logical thing the computer can understand. So yeah, once I'd kind of hit on the idea, that essentially what you're doing here is googling the story. Mm-hmm. Um, that that felt cool, and suddenly it was it, it suddenly made a lot of sense in my head because I was thinking this is although we're talking about a you know an experimental text game. Um, the, the kind of that that sense of using Google and and searching and type you know just people typing in text messages on their phone and stuff you know we're so used to just typing in little um, sentences of, of short words and things it just yeah that that kind of really formed in my head as being this kind of interesting path to go down. I know that you've uh, you've probably directed animators before or or worked with animators. Any difference between working with animated characters or you know directing an animator versus directing a human? Well, um, I've done quite a lot of directing of of live actors before. So oh, really? Um, yeah. So so Shattered Memories was was kind of motion capture and voiced. Um, similarly uh, a couple of games that haven't come out, and um, and then the, the last big project I worked on, we spent. Uh, it was about three years before this this project got cancelled. Um, we spent the last year of that um, doing full performance capture. Um, and in fact, the actress who stars in her story, Viva, um, I met her when we cast her on that production. So I'd worked with her for for about a year on that, um, which is is probably why she was kind of predominantly in my mind in terms of when I started thinking about this project and the characters, I thought that she would be perfect for the role. Um, I mean, the nice thing is, and, and I think this is partly how the idea came into my head was I spent a lot of time being very frustrated at the process of, of motion capture and this, the, the kind of the sheer amount of effort it would take to, to capture an actor's performance on the stage and then get that into the game engine. Um, and we'd always be in this scenario where we were reviewing the progress and we'd have two monitors we'd have a monitor that showed the in-game stuff in unreal engine or whatever and the other monitor would be just kind of a hand cam video footage from the shoot of the actors no makeup no costumes you know wearing the unflattering leotards (laughs) um and you know we would we would freeze frame this stuff and we'd say look that in the crappy video footage the twinkle in the eyes and the little smile there and the way they're exchanging that look 
nails the scene. That's beautiful. Um, whereas over here in game, we're not quite getting that. There's a problem with the character model, or the animation needs to be tweaked to you know get the expression right. We're just you know, and obviously it's, it was a necessity when you're making a, a kind of big 3D game that these things have to get put into the game engine and stuff. But there was always this frustration at how much money and time and effort went into trying to capture something which was just so easy to capture <laughs> with a video camera. Hmm. And, and this was something that I, you know, I would always talk about when I was talking with other writers and designers was, especially if people were talking to me about um, the horror game genre, because in movies, horror movies are this, this wonderful combination of being very low budget and they can have quite a high return on that because there's, there's, you know, there's an audience for them. But I think there's something so straightforward about the, the basic idea of a horror movie where you just need a cool location, probably a dark house somewhere, um, a cameraman and some actors who are going to be good at emoting and you know having the, the audience empathize with this and their predicament and that's kind of the cheap that's the cheapest thing you can do you know an indie movie you just need a camera and some actors sat in a room chatting you know that 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 can make an indie movie whereas in games that idea of having a kind of naturalistic realistic human performance that actually has a really high price tag attached to it so it's kind of the domain of the big blockbuster games to have those things in them. So it, it's kind of why something like Silent Hill, say, has become it stopped making sense because as game technologies have increased and as the kind of effort and money required to get that character performance in there has gone up and up and up, suddenly the idea of making a Silent Hill game, which is you know driven by realistic character performances and by the visuals and the atmosphere suddenly doesn't quite make as much sense because it's, you know, you're talking about a slightly more niche audience potentially, um, but there is a high cost factor associated with that. So, yeah, this was something that would I was always kind of complaining about and talking about was this, this question of performance in video games and how time-consuming and expensive it was. So when this idea kind of popped into my head, it was awesome because I guess the, one of the things I didn't, want to leave behind if I was stepping outside of those big teams and big budgets was I really enjoyed working with performers. And here was an idea where actually the performance was kind of key and central to it. Um, and where I would be able to get the most beautiful hair physics and body <laughs> physics and eye shaders, you know, and it, you know, that, so that, that became a very cool part of it for me. Is this a, is this a format that you could see yourself returning to for future games or does this feel sort of like a, now that you've uh, now that you've tried this, um, that uh, doing it again would be repeating yourself. Yeah, I think. I mean, I have I have some kind of cool ideas of, of very different, awesome things that could be done with video that are appealing to me. But at the same time, given that it's it's such a unique thing to do with a game, I don't want to suddenly become the video man. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm still yeah. Once I've recovered from launching this and had a bit of space to think about it, I'm going to kind of think what's next. Um, but it's I mean it's it's interesting to me because when I made Isle, you know the the hard thing is you making these things. A lot of times, the initial idea is kind of the structure or the the kind of the the gimmick that is doing something a bit different or trying something. And I fall in love with that. And then, then as I develop it, it becomes more about the stories and the characters and stuff. But it's always hard for me that I don't get the fun of actually playing these things for myself because it's, it's always the idea I fall in love with, um, but then I can't enjoy it because I've made the game. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so, uh, you know, quite a few people have kind of riffed on the one move game thing from Isle and it's cool to be able to play their games and experience it fresh um, so, you know, I'd love to see, um, you know, people doing similar things or playing around with some of the ideas in her story. That'd be neat. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a great structure and it's a, it, it seems accessible. So I hope we see a lot of people take these ideas and run with them in interesting new ways. A couple last things that we like to ask people, uh, when they come on the show, the first is like our show, uh, we, we cover short games. We cover games that you can probably pick up and, and finish in an evening or a weekend. Um, and I wondered if you had any specific favorites of yours, either inspirations for your games or just favorite games that they could complete in that very short chunk of time, whether they're like more traditional games or interactive fiction favorites or whatever. One of the big 
inspirations for me in terms of deciding to go independent um, was well, there was, there was a bunch of, of games. It was seeing a bunch of kind of micro studios or one or two people making games that uh, the difference for me was that they fully executed on their ideas. Because I think the, the thing I was nervous about was going independent and making a game that worked but would always be better if I'd had another few million pounds to spend on it or whatever. Mm. Whereas um, companies such as, for example, Simigo, their stuff, when I look at their games, I just think, you know, they that's the best version of that game they could have made. Mm. Uh, you know, that's fully executing on that vision. Um, so their games were a big inspiration. But also there's a game called Black Bar. I haven't played that yet. Oh, you should. So, so Black Bar is... Um, it's fantastic um and and similar to her story in that it has a a kind of gimmick no, gimmick's probably not a fair word but it, it has this <laughs> mechanic that is is very much about text input and plays to the frustrations of that but also it's, it's such a simple idea that you know that you just i mean when i first played this game i was just so insanely jealous because it's like this is such a cool idea and they've done it and they've owned it and you know no one else can have this idea now but hmm. it's such they are so uh, kind of uh, had a combination of jealousy and admiration for them. but the, the premise of black is wonderful you it's basically a series of letters sent to you from a friend who is living in a kind of orwellian uh dystopia where they censor everything hmm. so you receive these letters and the first letter you receive has a single word blacked out and the game mechanic is simply that you have to fill in the blacked out words and when you fill them all in correctly you get the next letter um, so it starts as simply as a single word blacked out and you can very quickly infer what that word is um, and fill it in and then you know it progresses so you it's telling this story through these letters um, and it, it, the, the the kind of this simple thing of having these words blacked out they really play with it and build on it um, with you know different ways of having you infer the content mm. and what's missing to the point where you know towards the end um you know there's 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 letters where almost every word is blacked out and, oh, wow. and you're like and you it's a bit like playing sudoku or something right where if someone shows you a kind of really complicated sudoku like, how the hell am i supposed to guess all these numbers but if you kind of slowly learn the tricks and the rules behind something like sudoku that gives you the kind of apparatus to kind of tackle something quite daunting um, and, and that game did that but yeah it was just so playful and clever and again it was just such a wonderful take on using words and text in a game um, and you know again it was, one, it was one of those games where you spend a lot of time just looking at the screen thinking which I always like um, but you know it's, it's fairly short if you don't get, get too stuck so I definitely definitely recommend Black Bar um, Another game that I'm always recommending to people that most people haven't played is on the 3DS. So if you've got a 3DS, it's on the, the eShop, and it's uh, the full name is, I'm probably going to get this wrong, is something like uh, Tokyo Tale Friday Monsters. Oh, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about, Attack of the Friday Monsters. Yeah. Attack of the Friday Monsters, yeah, which is... I downloaded that, and it's been sitting on my 3DS unplayed for weeks. So um, I'll bump that up to the top. There you of the go. Queue. Yeah, it's, it's, this is a cool game. It's um, and and has an interesting story to it because it's it's by a guy uh, whose development team apparently just make games about being a child in the summer in a rural part of Japan, um, and you know, so he is kind of. Uh, mastered evoking this kind of atmosphere of kind of uh, empty afternoons in the sun catching insects and just wandering around and being left to your own devices as a child um, and at some point level five asked him to um, make this game as part of they did like a series where they got lots of creators to make these small games and they sold them as a bundle in japan and then i think when they released them over here you could buy them individually so there's you know there's a sense in some of those games of, of people kind of having fun with it you know not working on something huge um having but there's still there's quite a lot of you know they, they have a nice production value to them. and in this game um you're in this this kind of rural village um and it reminded me of a lot of kind of nostalgic films like things like cinema paradiso uh some other stuff yeah. in uh, the series high map where you have this kind of idealized nostalgic remembering of what it was like to be a child in these kind of rural villages um, and it has very light gameplay the gameplay is mainly just be, you know, going to various places and talking to right people to, to move the story forward but it has such a lovely atmosphere these beautiful hand colored watercolor kind of backgrounds kind of you know traditional japanese animation look um and it's just so charming and the story is actually 
becomes somewhat silly and um, outrageous, um, but somehow manages doesn't doesn't break this kind of this sense this kind of real feel of kind of naturalism and kind of authenticity to the actual environment and the characters, um, and they throw into their giant monsters and spaceships and things in a way, and, and you're kind of left wondering if it's all in the kids' imaginations and, or not. And it's yeah, it's just very. Uh, definitely the atmosphere for me the atmosphere and the sense of being in this place it's one of those games where i have a few times just booted it up to walk around and just enjoy the atmosphere that it gives you um which is really nice we also kind of divide our show into pre-spoiler and post-spoiler sections and after after we play this interview um uh, I'm going to be chatting with some of my co-hosts about the game and uh, and sort of what path our investigations took and that sort of thing. Um, do you have anything to say to people who maybe have uh, already solved your mystery or think they have? Oh, I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm having a very hard time but not answering lots of people's questions about <laughs> <laughs> specifics. I've had a couple of people try and uh, the, apparently there's certain parts of the internet where people are having quite uh, heated oh, yeah. um, arguments about specific interpretations of, of various bits. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to go anywhere near that. I'm sure. Um, to put yeah. a, someone, was, someone had, had uh, decompiled, um, I don't know if that's the right phrase, decompiled the game to try and get at variable names and things to, <laughs> to kind of say this was the author's intent as to what was happening. Um, so I don't really want to mess with that because I just think that's brilliant. I mean, I that that is it's great to me i don't um yeah i'm not one for stepping in and going no no this is what it's about um, yeah it has this a uh, little bit of an element of a like arg or, or things like that where where now the the game has become its own game on the internet of people trying to uh to suss out exactly what was going on and exactly what was in your head as you were creating it and um frankly i can't wait to uh to talk about, <laughs> um, uh, it, it was just very exciting to uh, to investigate it and to come up with my own ideas, and then later to go on the internet and and read about what everybody else thought was going on. The the, the coolest thing I saw was um, it was initially not so cool because uh, I being uh, probably um, too old now, I guess I have my own children. I'm definitely you know on the shelf. Um, you know I can't get my head around uh, YouTubing and Twitch and and kind of that whole thing. Um, you know, my when I picked my son up from school, you know, all the kids in the playground are talking about the games they watch other people play. You know, and, and the, celeb, the the people who to them are celebrities. You know, the, the various streamers and people. Um, so that's kind of a thing that I'm I haven't you know experienced firsthand is, is that culture. And so the kind of surreal thing of people streaming my game. So here's a game about sitting and watching video clips, and people are sitting and watching other people sit and watch the video clips. Um, <laughs> and, but then the, um, one of the guys sent me a link and, you know, he'd been playing the game with uh, his audience. Um, and so there's something about uh, clicking on some of the, the, the kind of streamers playing the game, seeing the big kind of run of comments with people going, this is amazing. I can't wait till next episode. This is fascinating. I can't wait to find out what happens next. I just love the big revelation we had and this is just so awesome and, and addictive i can't wait to see the next thing and there's part of me that, that kind of wants to step in and say well you could go and buy the yeah. game um, <laughs> guys it's just like six bucks come on <laughs> yeah but you know i know that that's just how things work um, yeah and i appreciate it but yeah this this guy sent me a link uh and his audience of i don't know you know how many thousands of people were watching him play the game and as he was playing they had a collaborative google doc open and in which hundreds of people were as he was playing writing stuff down, transcribing things, writing their suggestions for keywords, writing theories. Mm. And, and this, you know, this document was huge. Um, and I mean, that was awesome. It was, you know, the idea that, cause you know, to my mind, video games are something a bit like novels that you sit and read yourself. Um, and, and as, and as big as that ever gets is kind of couch players sitting and playing it with someone else or other people and, and kind of enjoying it in your living room. But it's still, you know, to, to my mind, it's, it's a thing you just sit and it's quite a private experience. Um, but yeah, knowing that this is how people, some people are playing her story and it's more like going to see a live show in the theater or something. And, and there's that sense of the communal gasp when something gets revealed and, you know, everyone's suddenly the comments explode. It was like, oh my God, oh my God, OMG, OMG. And, and you know, that, <laughs> that kind of sense of the kind of, you know, the amplification that you get with an audience um, is really, really awesome. So, um, and that's, that was actually something that when I started this project, I 
and, and you were saying about how this kind of feels like it's connected back to Isle. One of the things that gave me a bit of confidence about making this game was um, before is before I made the decision to to kind of jump ship. Essentially, was I was becoming aware that people were still playing Isle, and um, you know, articles would crop up from time to time talking about it. Um, and I did a couple of kind of uh, public events talking about game storytelling and stuff. And in one of them, the organizers pulled out aisle to my surprise um, and then got the audience to kind of play it, you know, by shout, they had a microphone going around the audience and people would shout out things to type in. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was really, it it was weird because I I didn't, you know, I made that game so long ago, I just didn't recognize the voice, you know, the the, the writings. It was like someone else's writing to me, but it was just really cool to see, the kind of excitement that an audience had around the playfulness of typing stuff in and, 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 you know, it, it played very nicely to an audience. And then, um, similar things happened there in Toronto. They have a, a festival called the world play word play festival. And they did a live performance of Isle there, which went down very well. Hmm. Um, and so that was very much kind of in my head when I was thinking, is this an idea that will play, you know, was seeing the appetite for Isle and, and that element of Isle, um, felt like that was something that was going to be in her story. So yes, then seeing on the other end now that there is this kind of thing of people playing it with these large audiences of uh, people online, it's kind of cool. Or even just a small audience of of more than one. I know that um, with games like this, I love to uh, play them along with my wife or with somebody else sitting there, you know, uh, so we can discuss the decisions that we're going to make or the, you know, the theories that we have about the plot. And um, this is the perfect game for that. And the, and the reason it works so nicely is because the person who's driving the game isn't necessarily having the fun, right? It's not like if you watch someone else, because I remember that um, <clears throat> when the Spy Shot came out, my wife was really attracted to the, the look of that game and the kind of style and ambience of that game. But obviously sitting and watching someone play that game it can be frustrating because they're in charge of the camera you know second to second they're making very snappy quick judgments and and you know that so you are excluded as the other player sat on the sofa but yeah something like this where a lot of the kind of thinking time happens outside of the game where you can sit and reflect yes makes a lot more sense when you're playing it um kind of collaboratively or or with someone else on the sofa and i think when the second or first or second round of testers, quite a few people came back and said that they'd been playing it with their partners or with friends. Um, um, and, you know, in some cases, friends or partners who hadn't necessarily got a very strong interest in video games. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they were able to just look over the shoulder, see the, you know, the video of, a, of the performance and the character and recognize that as a human being. And then, oh, what do you have to do? Oh, you just type in words. Oh, okay, what about this? And then, you know, very quickly kind of getting what the experience was and kind of being drawn into it. So yeah, that's been a, a hugely gratifying part for me. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming on the show. I was thrilled by the game. I thought it was just one of the best things I've played in a, in a very, very long time. And I'm uh, I'm so glad I was able to connect with you to, to chat about it. Uh, and thanks again so much for coming on the show. I mean, this, is, uh, this has been a little bit of a thrill. Cool. I've enjoyed it. It's nice to talk. Thanks again to Sam Barlow. I'm really thrilled that he was willing to come on the show and uh, and chat about his game. And uh, he had some really interesting things to say there. I actually had to edit that down a little bit for time. And so if you were enjoying that, I'm going to be dropping a little bit of stuff that uh, was only sort of vaguely related to the game after the end credits music. So if you uh, if you enjoyed that, stick around after the end of the uh, episode. Uh, Sam Barlow and I also talked a little bit about his favorite uh, crime fiction as well as he uh, talked a little bit about his uh, favorite police interview video that he saw while researching for the game, which was a little bit surprising and pretty interesting. So um, stick around after the uh, after the outro music if you're interested. So before we get into the spoiler break, uh, just a quick rundown of our top-level impressions. I mean, we've talked a little bit about how this is a bit crime scene investigator, not quite the uh, forensic angle. It's more of the detective at the uh, console typing in. It's got a lot of cool aesthetics. Um, you can even turn on and off an anti-glare filter if you are feeling it's a little too 1994 for you. Um, <laughs> when you type things into searches, it gives you a mechanical keyboard nose, which I know Reagan was probably fond of. <laughs> oh, yes. He likes the clicky keyboard. Well, when I did that on my iPad, it really enhanced the experience. My only 
complaint about this game, and it's not a complaint really, was that I played it on a 5S, iPhone 5S, and sometimes the buttons were a little too small for me to know that I tapped them properly. Uh, the terminal um, hitting like search and things like that. So I would recommend if you can play it on either one of the bigger iPhones, an iPad, or your computer. But I still had a fantastic time playing this game on my iPhone. In hindsight, I would have played it on something with a little bigger screen. Yeah, it was marvelous on the iPad. Yeah, exactly. And so if your iPhone is your only option, play it, please. Don't don't make me... I don't want to sound, make it sound like it was a terrible experience on the iPhone, but it was a little small. So I would have played it on my computer had I known. So, so something I can't believe we haven't mentioned. We've said video clips. We didn't say these are live video clips yeah. of an actual actress. It's just that's, one that's actress point. changing clothes. I mean, it's it's not a cartoon. It's not animated. It is a human being. And that's one of the huge differences in this because there's so much that you can't get through um, without actually seeing someone in flesh and blood acting out this story. And it immeasurably changes this game from every other, you know, you mentioned L.A. Noir. I just kept seeing Ken Cosgrove, you know, because the mocap on the, the actor for Mad Men. No, this is a person. You can see her be frazzled. You can see her be upset. You can see her be serious, funny. And a marvelous performance. I mean, oh, the, wonderful. The, the lady that they got to do this, I, I've never seen her in anything before, um, but I think she's got, like, she nails it in every scene of this game. Um, and it's a tricky character to pull off because there's a lot going on, a lot of ambiguity that that's sort of required while also kind of having, you know, an emotional moment in, in all of these clips. Um, and also she's a pretty decent singer. Yeah, it, she it's a fantastic performance on every level. And that is the engaging part about this game. It was so basically when you do a keyword search, uh it'll give you the five videos like we talked about, but there's a little like marker on it whether you've watched that video or not. And I'd say probably the only gamey aspect of this because I think there's a strong argument that this is more in the interactive fiction world than it is necessarily a game game. But definitely one of the most gamey aspects of it was the satisfaction you feel when you do a keyword search and it's five fresh unseen videos. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the most like, I felt like, yeah, that was a perfect search. Like a hundred points. Yeah. A hundred <laughs> points. Nate. <laughs> also visually, this game absolutely nailed it. I mean, we talked about the visual presentation a minute ago. Obviously it's this, you know, real actor, uh, performing the 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 dialogue, but uh, it's also a 1994 setting, and it nails that in every detail, it, down to you know, including the fashion, little references in the text, um, and even the computer. And the the computer that you're you know quote unquote searching this stuff on is very true to the 1990s. It has a a, a very old school windows 3.1, uh, aesthetic. And, um, you know, even the, uh, even there's a, there's a trash can with some files in it that you can open up. I mean, it's very, it's very like a nineties computer. It's, it's, it's really neat. Well, yeah, it's just, there's not a lot of visual elements in this game, um, nor are there are a lot of sound elements, but what is there is very well done. It really looks like this video was probably shot on a modern camera, but then, you know, fed onto a VHS tape and then dubbed onto another VHS tape over a bad wire during a, you know, solar flare and then re-imported again. I mean, it, it really does look like a 90s video. Typical 90s style, solar flare. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one other um, aesthetic thing, but I think it might be a spoiler, so I'll hold it. Um, I was curious if... Um, for people who haven't played the game, are there any favorite searches? I, I definitely think you should let your heart guide you through. Yeah. But um, there are a few that I found particularly interesting. Yeah, there are some things where you you would think you, you always start by, or at least I started by searching the sorts of things that you would imagine a police person searching in a database like crime or, you know, um, alibi or whatever you know you start searching that stuff but what really you starts did. opening I did things up yeah. well yeah i i, I, I tried to go about it very uh, stuff. organized but what really started opening it up for me were little searches when they mentioned things that were emotionally interesting to them um and if you if you search those things sometimes you open up whole sort of emotional angles that you weren't expecting and the one that for me like 
she mentioned the words fairy tale in a couple of different clips I ran into. And I thought, what is she talking about? She, she says like a fairy tale a couple of times. And so I searched that phrase and she talks about fairy tales a lot. And a lot of the clips in which she's talking about fairy tales really bear on the, uh, the emotional angle of, of what's going on. And because this is so much about why done it rather than just who done it. Um, it was really interesting for me. It was all about motive. So I was constantly typing in, names trying to find a someone involved that i had mm-hmm. that i'd missed uh, there are a lot of people involved in this um so whenever a new name was mentioned i would write that down and that would be my next search um so that was a lot of my first ones but i mean for what it's worth like you know you said uh it it, it starts out with murder as <laughs> as the first search it's your preset term Oh, and I mean, so brilliant that that's the first uh, the first search term that it fills in for you in all caps. And there are exactly five uses of the word murder in the entire investigation in all seven interviews. Four. Are there four? Only four. There are four. And, uh, and the last one is also the last clip in the entire 270 odd clips. And it's really it, it, like that first set of clips – Oh, you think he was murdered? And then the final clip. I'll even play it here. I'd like to speak to a lawyer now. Please. You have no murder weapon. You have nothing. And all these stories we've been telling each other. Just that. Stories. It's just... It really, it really tells you there's more here than meets the eye and that you're investigating not just who did it and when, but something deeper. There's something below the surface here that we don't see yet. My, I will say my tactic was um, to, you know, just write down interesting words as I was listening and let that just, you know, kind of freeform guide my first three searches. I won't say the fourth because I think it's a spoiler. Um, were Murder Stories Dollhouse. Oh, interesting. First three things I searched. Um, Something that is nice is you actually can look back at your query history. And I think probably when we get into theories, we'll be talking more about words we tried. But let's just get to the spoilers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this was this was an incredibly cool game. And I do not want you, listener, to spoil the the mystery of it for yourself. Um, don't please don't so we're going to have a spoiler break here i'm deadly serious this game costs six dollars you can get it on any platform that you have more or less you can play it on computers both uh, windows and mac you can buy it directly from the developer's website and we'll have a link in the show notes or you can buy it on steam where it's actually been getting pretty good reviews which uh actually surprised me a little um, because of some of the tone of the reviews there lately but uh people seem to be loving this game uh you Uh, can $4.99 Four ninety nine on iPhone. And nice. IPad. Okay, so six bucks on computer, um, five bucks on iOS. If you have an iPad, that would be my preferred way because I actually bought the uh, the I bought the computer version and ended up switching to the iPad because I wanted to be able to walk around with it more easily because I couldn't unglue myself from it. You so. wanted to be able to pace exactly back and forth from kitchen to living room. Yeah, and I did. I did pace around the house with it, and I went and showed it to my wife and asked her questions about it and. Uh, if you can play this game along with someone else, do it. It's a great game to sort of collaborate with a friend on. So if you haven't played this game, go play this game. Now we're going to have a spoiler break, and we're going to talk about our theories, because this game was super um, mysterious, obviously. It's a mystery, um, but it leaves a lot to your individual you know, sense of deduction, and uh, even... Even having seen all of the content of the game, there's at least a couple of possible theories. And so we're going to be talking about our theories on the uh, you know, on the mystery. Do not listen to this unless you've played the game. Uh, so go and play that game for sure. Here's your spoiler break. How do we want to approach this? We can do a, uh, a, uh, a um, serial rip off (laughs) definitely yes so here's what we know 
what we know is that Simon, who is Hannah's uh, husband, husband right. has been found dead in the cellar, wrapped up in a bag um, amongst a collection of just kind of old riffraff from Hannah's life. And what we're trying to figure out is specifically who killed him and, more importantly, why. Mm -hmm. So initially we're trying to determine, really, why are the police talking to Hannah? And why are they talking to her so many times over so many days? Because, I mean, at first she just seems like a typical bereaved young wife. You know, she's uh, she's come to the police initially to ask for help in finding uh, Simon. So the first couple of interviews, I think... Um, it's unclear that Simon is even dead yet, or, you know, we, we don't know that he's dead. Um, but if, since you're picking this up all out of order, um, it's obvious pretty much from the start that Simon is dead. Your first search term is murder. Right. Yeah. You, you assume he's dead, but, um, for me, one of the big first realizations that I came across was that it was not only was it Hannah that went to the police first about a missing person, but it was also Hannah who found him dead in their own home. And uh, found the body in in multiple bags. Uh, it doesn't go into much gruesome detail there. but In bin bags. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, if we hadn't mentioned, uh, like Sam British. Barlow. British. British as hell in all of this. Yeah, I uh, I made the mistake of searching basement. <laughs> right? Uh, which, no, no, which no. Brought, yeah, yeah, which brought zero <laughs> results. Cellar brought a lot of results. <laughs> and trash bags would also give you zero results, whereas bin bags. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, it, that's the initial mystery that I was spending a lot of, you know, work trying to solve is who killed Simon. And the longer you search, the more obvious it becomes that at least the police strongly suspect Hannah. At least for me, one of the first kind of trails that I hit on, and I think it might have been in the first set that you get is something about Simon liking blondes. And so that was my first like thing I tried to figure out, like who's another blonde woman that's involved. And there's a bartender that's, a, I think her name is Helen, um, mm -hmm. that I kind of was like, all right, I got this already. It's, it's the, like Simon was having an affair with Helen and something happened. And, 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 and like, that was kind of the game to me was like, you come up with a theory based off of something they said, and you do search queries to to kind of back up your theory. And then it's once you start watching these, you're like, okay, I'm wrong. That's not Now it. it's so, this. Guys, my third search term was attic. So I got to the attic clip very That's early and was like, what? So yeah. I, I got into something weird is happening very early. Yeah. I did not stay in the land of normalcy for more than three searches. So uh, see, I, think I went. I had a different. I went to a really lot of that stuff pretty later. Although yeah. I, I did end up, um, uh, I did end up getting some glean of some weirdness there very early on when it describes the midwife. Um, so yeah, I, I, with you, I also saw a lot of very late in the interview clips, very early in the game, which reveals something really strange, which is that Hannah slash Eve. He uses the name Eve a couple of times, which we don't learn who that is until a little later. Hannah, it depending tells, on how you played, right? Uh, <laughs> Hannah tells her own life story in a couple of these different clips in different ways, and she starts telling a very bizarre story about having been raised by the neighbor, um, you know, who is a midwife, and so very. Very early, I think, Laura, you and I both kind of came across some... Different things. In mine, yeah. um, in mine, um, the woman talking, didn't have a name yet, said that she was living in the attic and Hannah would come play with her. So I assumed Hannah was her daughter for a while until I actually got to a clip where the woman says, uh, Hannah Smith, H-A-N spells her name. Right. I was like, oh, yeah. she's Hannah. This whole thing is broken. Yeah, let's go straight to it. Um, we know that, or we have a pretty solid idea that uh, that Simon was murdered by Hannah. The the or or Eve. The question or is Eve. is is Hannah suffering from a extreme multiple personality disorder, or is there literally two people 
that are twins involved in this story. Yeah. And how, and how you get to that and how you explore it and the the I came at it in a very roundabout way. Oh yeah, yeah. And and if there are twins, which one killed Simon and why? Also, There's so many layers to this. Did you guys get into the parents? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Han- I, Eve totally killed the parents. Oh, I, one I, of my favorite so, yeah. stories is I guess spoilers for a book from the 1950s. Um, <laughs> Whoa. Whoa, too soon. Um, we Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson has a phenomenal opening sen- opening paragraph that um, ends in about a- an ode to the death cat mushroom and says, all of my family is dead. Um, and I feel like Eve because of the parent story, is basically the crazy sister in the attic who kills the parents with death cat mushrooms. There's no way that's not a reference. Wow. It's in a similar English town, too. So Interesting. Good, um, uh, good catch there. One of my favorite books. You guys should read it. Okay, that's awesome. I have not, and I will, because that sounds really interesting, and I love this game. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, super fascinating. Um, Side story. I think that the, and there's, the game is full of red herrings. So many really cleverly placed red herrings like uh, you mentioned you know simon's preference for blondes and the fact that it mentions several blondes throughout the thing but as far as i could tell none of them had any actual bearing on no the, i went the story. except eve wears a blonde wig when well, she sings right exactly right, of course and well and that's the connection simon likes blondes and simon might have known something about her split her multiple personality if you believe that it's multiple personality and that might have been why they killed I don't know. It's very hard to say. So there's really sort of two ways that this could possibly go. Either Eve is a really brilliant – well, actually, I I think there's maybe three. I think there's possibly three things that could be going on here. And let's talk about the relative merits of each one and and how we come down. Either uh, Hannah has split personalities and has this alternate personality, Eve, that she thinks is her twin sister and um, that – you know, she's because of this uh, mental instability, she kills her husband and she and her split personality are, you know, are one are one human being or they are actual real legitimate twins that her story as as uh, as sort of crazy as it sounds about her being, you know, her mother having twins, but one of them seeming to have died in childbirth, the um, the midwife taking her away and raising her separately. Eventually, the midwife dies, and she, as an eight-year-old girl, finds her, uh, her real sister and goes and lives as sort of her ghost or mirror in the, in the attic and hides to the point where even her family doesn't know that she exists. Only her sister does. Th- those two possibilities. Or a third, which is that... Um, It is one person. She's not insane. And all of this is done as an incredibly brilliant way to get off the hook for the murder. That the entire story that she concocts is a way of creating an alternate personality for herself so that, oh, no, I didn't do it. My sister did it. And my sister is gone. So where do you come down on on those three possibilities? I will say that I... um... I disagreed at f- with multiple personality disorder and same person originally because of the um, there are bruises that swap sides of faces. Mm, yeah. Um, and because uh, there's a tattoo. But I did look back and uh, most of the um, I just don't think that the tattoo could have been gotten in a day and the police would check if it was a fake because a tattoo can't disappear and reappear in a day. And although there are long sleeve shirts worn by, you know, on the right days for both characters. So most of the time people are wearing long sleeve shirts. Um, the Hannah character often wears short sleeve shirts. And it's shown in one point, Eve spills coffee on herself, takes off her white tank top and reveals she has a tattoo. Mm. So Eve messes up. Which was, by the way, my favorite red herring of the entire game when she spills the coffee on herself because I was going crazy. What, the only way that you can tell when one interview interview ends and the next begins, um, apart from the date stamps and occasionally those change, is that the shirt that, that the character is wearing changes. And then in this case, she changes shirt in the middle of an interview. And I was – Trying to figure out. On the same day. Yeah, on the Mm -hmm. same day. And I was trying to think, oh man, is this, you know, did they call them both in? Did they interview one and then the other? Or what happened here? And then on a whim at some point, 
I searched the word fuck in the I did too. That's term, how I found it too. And and there's a clip oh, in which she spills it. coffee on herself yeah, and, I and changes one. her shirt mid interview. And the, the only, only word she word says, she says, says is, is fuck. fuck. <laughs> so if you don't search the word fuck, you don't see the shirt come off. The yeah. shirt get changed. So it's a complete red herring. Uh, it, it is the same person. It's just the most mundane explanation for something that I was trying for hours, maybe. I don't know that about hours, but trying really hard to figure out why or, you know, why she somehow was in a different shirt. Oh, it's okay. She just spilled coffee on herself. <laughs> yeah, and, and I say they do have enough disambiguation because, again, with the tattoo, even after the tattoo is revealed, the subsequent people are wearing long sleeves, so you can't tell if the tattoo is gone or not. So they do try to shake it up, but I just... The tattoo is the one thing that I've not been able to reconcile. My theory is that it's split personality. And I also believe that there's probably no one true answer. You know, and our the the goal of this game is for you to make your own conclusions. But I, I think everything had led to split personality until the tattoo. And I just could not figure out why one scene someone seemed to have it and the other scene someone did not have that tattoo. And or you're maybe right. even more convincingly than the tattoo, there's the moment where one of them has a bruise on her face. Uh, and then in the next interview, only one day later, the bruise is completely gone. And the police officer asks about the bruise and she, and she touches the, the wrong, wrong side of her face. face as if she'd yeah. been looking in a mirror or looking at somebody else when, you know, she was thinking of it. Like it, it, she touched the wrong side of her face, which is exactly what you'd do if you'd only seen the bruise on someone else. So here's a really minor one. And this is a bit of an Easter egg. Um, did you guys look up the tap codes? Yes, you know I did. About? Yes. No, I don't know what you're talking um, oh, about. Oh, brilliant. So there is one, um, you mentioned the scene where um, Hannah um, says, like, oh, God, why did I mention Eve? And puts her head down and, like, taps on the table. Yeah, and she taps in a very distinctive way. And I thought, that seems odd and slightly meaningful. First, I looked yeah, up Morse okay. code. And then I looked up tap code because I do puzzle solving on the weekend. And <laughs> I know what that is. Well, um, she mentions and- it in a later clip, which is when I finally was able to go back and, and actually figure it out. She taps, as far as I could tell, in two different clips. Right. And she mentions in one of them, in one of the very late clips, that when she and her sister were growing up together in the house and trying to pass messages to each other, you know, and she was staying hidden in the attic, they would tap messages to each other using a tap code that was used by like prisoners in in prison and i'd mm-hmm. never heard of this but there's a wikipedia article on it fortunately yes and um the i found that through the word secret searching the word secret um and the tap code again part of the they have different skill sets they mention different things that one is good at and one is bad at um one actually tries to tap out by hannah Eve does, but messes up two of the letters. Oh, yeah. So I was puzzled um, by that, but that makes sense now that you mention it. She's just and then not the other one code. types out correctly. Mm-hmm. So it, it's actually like, to me, that just shows someone with two different skill sets because it's harder to, even multiple personalities, I, I feel like you wouldn't forget the alphabet. Yeah. I still think it's, I think it's the split personality. I think mm. I like... There's, I come down pretty hard on the on the it's twins side. Oh, really? Actually. Yeah, I just can't believe it. Well, coffee orders are different. The coffee orders are different. One yeah, likes yeah. black. One likes sugar and milk. One likes yeah, but that doesn't tea. Descri- that like, actually was like they're the three people. They could fake, but that. that's but all fine on that. split personality. Like that's either or. It's like the only mm-hmm. stuff that makes me think twins is like the literally two different people at the different places at the same time. Other than that, you can totally justify any. Character differences, reaction differences, preference differences can all land mm-hmm. on split personality. Well, Hannah's alibi, which is that she drove to Glasgow and had a uh, – she was pregnant at the time of the um, event and uh, had her – got into a car accident in Glasgow and had to be checked out by a doctor. And that's an established alibi. That is a fact of the case. And – you have to really put yourself through so many mental gymnastics to figure out how that could happen and her be able to murder Simon if she's only in one place at a time. That that's that plus the bruise and the tattoo, I really came down on the it's twins um, side. And if that's the case, I actually like that story best because what oh, that yeah. means. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's, obs- it's crazy, right? It's insane. <laughs> yeah. It's a crazy thing. What that means is that if they're twins, Hannah 
who is actually married to Simon, is the one that killed him because uh, her sister had an affair incognito with Simon. So I think from Simon's perspective, he sees his wife wearing a wig and playing, you know, music at a club and goes and sleeps with his own wife. But it's actually an affair in the eyes of her sister, you know, Hannah. So um, when Hannah finds out that he slept with Eve, um, she kills him. And uh, then Eve, I think, covers for it so that Hannah can get away. So two things. One, it has not escaped my attention that the two twins on the podcast are the two people who are really into the twin theory. Yes. Yep. Shane's two. not here, but uh, but uh, he agrees with me on this matter. But uh, so do you. So I guess that's three. Three twins. For the listeners who weren't aware, <laughs> we've got multiple twins on this podcast. I am not actually twins of the twins. That would be weird. That would be weird. Um, Wait, you're a twin, Laura? Yeah. She's actually been two people. She's been alternating episodes. I don't know if you realize this. Yeah, we just swap. And that's why sometimes I have continuity issues. Yeah. Um, except they don't in this Anyway, you got a real Mary um, Kate but, and Ashley Olsen situation going on here. <laughs> oh, yep. Absolutely. Um, the other uh, point that I was going to make was that um, I think that she doesn't necessarily get mad about uh, Hannah doesn't get mad that Simon is sleeping with Eve. I think she gets mad that it's the birthday and right. he gives them the same mirror. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. And it's that. supposed to be a one of a kind, unique mirror. And he gives it to makes someone else. two of them. And he gives one to Eve and one to Hannah, and Hannah catches on and slashes the throat with a mirror. Yeah, yeah. Which so is, you yeah, don't which give makes the same sense. woman the same gift. I'm not actually positive now that I think about it whether Simon. I, I guess from what you mentioned there, I think it probably is more likely that Simon didn't realize that Eve was when he saw Eve playing in the you know whatever he he didn't realize that it was his wife in a wig. He was just straight up cheating on her. Yeah, he was straight up cheating on her with somebody who looked a lot like his wife, which is kind of weird. Like, I like not just looked a lot like, was literally identical other like, than apart from a, a blonde wig. wig. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, hey, he has a type. You know, we'll give him that. Yeah. And both of them, there's also a lot of uh, a lot of confusion about the pregnancies in, in the game. You know, which one is pregnant at which point in the plot? And uh, which one is the mother of Sarah, the the daughter um, that it mentions? Mm -hmm. And I think that what makes the most sense is that Hannah was pregnant and miscarried, but that Eve later actually becomes pregnant. And um, well, uh, there's a whole thing with Eve, though, where she talks about she tried really, really hard to get pregnant and had to give up because she got an STD. Right. Right. But um, she says she tried to sleep with a lot of men when Hannah was pregnant with the first baby. Um, because they had to she stay wanted matching. to maintain the swamp. They had to match. And she got an STD, so she stopped. But then she said later on when she was having sex with Simon that they have sex in the parents' house. And she gets pregnant again. Mm -hmm. And she said, I thought I was, I thought we were infertile. Um. And so the thing that convinced me that Eve was actually pregnant, besides actually mapping the peop the outfits to the people, was that um, the uh, Hannah character says something about our baby, our baby, and then mm -hmm. and then the other one always says my baby. Mm. So it was like ah shared baby, and they're like um, Simon will have something to outlive him. Um, It'll be our baby. And the other one says, you know, my baby will live on. Yeah. So I was like, our baby, my baby was my whole theory for the. Yeah. Also, I, only one throws up. Good point. As my, uh, as the proponent for the, um, I guess, as the assumed proponent for split personality uh, on this podcast, the main reason I have been and not believing in the twins is the absurdity of the concept that this could happen. Um, and <laughs> uh, is I, it really any more absurd than the premise of literally any law and order? Well, sure. <laughs> and, but I, I, I liked to, I like going into this game or I, I approached this very differently than I approached an episode, would approach an episode of a law and order. And maybe that's my, my fault. Like I should, if I'm willing to accept that there is a split personality as ridiculous as this game supposes, because 
it is it is like over the top on what split personality could actually do. Um, then I should also assume that this ridiculous <laughs> twins <laughs> like life swap thing could also po- be possible. Yeah, because it is pretty. Everything ridiculous. you guys are saying, I-, I agree with, and so now I'm sitting here saying like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I guess it's twins. <laughs> But it's but, okay. so ridiculous that yeah. they would like that they like they they're supposing that a family a, and a, a re- a, an apparently reasonably good family the mom and dad by all accounts seem to be relatively good people would just not catch on to the fact that there is an an entire other human living in the attic of their house for a <laughs> long well, time for their entire well, lives. I will say Eve, unreliable narrator Eve, is sitting there in the last session. Just trying to stall out while Hannah goes away. Yeah. So I think they could have been like legit twins. Both parents are dead. Like they could have been cousins. Tw- I don't. You know, the the whole yeah. like swapping and like living yeah. dual lives is one interview at the end. And I think and Eve it could, could be it could completely be full of bullshit. Yeah. Waiting. F- so that Hannah can get away from the cops. Like I think even if twins, they had could have a more likely story. You know, maybe yeah, adopted, I see what fostered, you're and she comes back in and then makes out this outlandish tale just to wait it out. But she's in a way accepting guilt for the murder. Then so no, actually, it's in, not it's quite the opposite because it, her whole story puts the guilt for the murder on Hannah. But Hannah, by this point, is gone, and if yeah. she if she can establish to the police that she is Eve. And as far and at least by her story, Eve is basically a non-person. She probably, you know, she doesn't have a social security number. She's a she's a you know, she's a ghost. But if she can establish to the police that she is Eve, then they can't pin anything on her because she doesn't exist. She at the most, though, she would be like an accessory. Like if they're if they buy her story, then they also buy that it was Hannah that did the slashing and uh, and that Eve is just an accessory. Yeah. And I'll say the whole story is ridiculous. Yeah. But um, I, I there are a couple things. Um, I didn't want to believe that the last um, juicy story held all the secrets and was completely 100% true because yeah. I've been trained never to believe that. Um, a couple things did point to the fact that they are sharing information. The diary entry, they there's word for word repeats of stories of different days. Um, there's See, the phrase that- everybody on the same page. You know, that seems yeah, actually that to me, though, less like it's one person to me. That's true. No, to me, that was it was more likely it was one person. If they're literally going to say the same thing word for word, like I could like, I guess it's just an argument for either way, because you could say it's mm-hmm. since it's the same person, they would just say it the same way every time. And not that it's like a memorized phrase. It's just like true. each side of the personality would repeat it exactly the same. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's really I, like, that, and that's what's really so interesting about this is that, like, if you look up uh, forum discussions about this game, this type of discussion, there is no end point to this discussion. Uh, this is which it, is great. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I kind of feel like it has some of the elements of, and I talked about this a little bit with Sam Barlow. It, it has some of the elements of like an ARG, in that like part of the game is is once you've played the actual content going in and discussing it with people and trying to get to the bottom of it and, and to figure out what the, you know, the intent of it all is. Um, so I think half of the, half of the enjoyment I got out of this game after I played it was just going on and reading some really interesting forum topics about it. I totally recommend doing that. Yeah. I've been holding and waiting for this conversation and now exactly. I will go and Me look too. at all those forums. Yeah. I should say um, I don't, I, I landed up until this podcast I was pretty sure that it was split personality, but I never had a motive. And so I like your guys' motive far more than mine, which was something around Eve getting jealous that uh, Hannah had the life and Eve did not. One of my favorite little trolls of the game, and there are many little search trolls that if you try to search specific words, they just give you bullshit. Um, My favorite is if you search twins, it's just closer than going, twins, psst. No. <laughs> Twins? Yeah. Really? Um, um, yeah. And I, I actually, my too. early on, because um, Simon works for Glacier, I searched reflection really early. Um, and they always refer to each other as my reflection. Like, 
I, I saw my reflection. I saw, you know, um, which got me the murder really early. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and because some of like, those uh, those clips are so short, you know, they might say my reflection in a clip and you have no idea that they're actually referring to their their sister. They might only be talking about like their literal reflection in a mirror or something. And it's very ambiguous. This was a masterpiece of editing, by the way, like just film editing. Oh, like every clip is so thought out to the point where it's like, like you, you have, he has to have gotten a really specific understanding of exactly what you learn from each clip of all 200 some odd of them and how likely you are given any search term to see any one of them. It's really cunningly constructed. And I'd say this is almost more of a work of, um, of, of like film editing and and script writing than it is a work of game design like it's a really absurdly good piece of editing yeah it's like it's just metadata and search terms and it's incredible um major kudos um the thing i wanted to mention before that i thought was a spoiler is if you get certain clips and i can't i couldn't tell if it was certain clips or if it was certain numbers of clips i think it was tied to because every time I, I got this reaction, it was after I'd seen a really meaningful, juicy piece of information. You can get a little bit of a police siren and you get a really strong reflection in the glass. Yeah. Of of in the 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 game interface of um, what looks like kind of like a woman. It was freaking me out because it looked like me. Um, I <laughs> suppose you two as men don't get that. I was like, are they using your webcam? Wait, it was really, but it looked really like creepy. me. <laughs> Whoa. No, it definitely looked like a woman. Well, I thought they might have turned on the iPhone camera. That would have made sense. And, like, given you a slight reflection of you. And I was freaked out. I was like, I didn't give this permission to use yeah. my iPhone camera. No, I noticed that, too. And um, it, I do think it was when you learned something that was, you know, quote, unquote, important. Um, although, mm -hmm. you know, it, it seemed almost random at times. Um, but... I think that's something we didn't really talk about, which is that the whole game, it's kind of a mystery who you, the player, are playing as. You're never really sure what your motive is in investigating what happened in 1994, why, you in, why you're investigating all of this stuff. And that's the first clue that you get. Um, and you know, the, you, there is a note in a text file on the desktop that is signed SB, which I think is Sam Barlow, um, where it mm -hmm. says, uh, you know, like, Here's all the details on why this uh, this these clips are here, uh, and you know, let me know when you're done. And uh, it's pretty clear at the end when the credits roll, and you know, it invites you to close the game. Essentially, like it, it uh, the a chat window pops up asking you if you are well and truly done, like if you've seen enough. And uh, it, the chat is is addressed to Sarah, so I'm pretty confident that you know you are playing as the daughter of Eve. Well, it actually says, so, Sarah, do you understand why your mother did it? And I think that's when I actually exited and kept playing a little longer because I knew Sarah was one of the proposed names for the miscarried baby. Mm -hmm. um, it was Sarah or Ava. And then Sam was like, I want a palindrome name. She's like, nope, we have Hannah and Eve already. No yep. more palindromes. <laughs> Um, so she wanted to name the daughter Sarah, but she miscarried. So I presumed at that point that um, Eve named her baby Sarah to replace the miscarried baby. Um, and then I started thinking maybe the baby was dead and maybe the baby is alive and given to another midwife. And I was like, no, no, no. All too complicated. And <laughs> Turtles yeah. all the way down. Yeah. And stop. The cycle repeats itself. Yeah. I, and uh, I, it actually left me with some questions about Sarah. Like, you know, the, the question in the chat was something like, do you understand now why your mother did what she did or something like that? Mm -hmm. And it's like, but what are we referring to? Because if did we're what to she did. Yeah, did what she did, but what is it that she did? And are, are we supposed to be forgiving her, forgiving her mother for like, well, it, it still left me with more questions that I don't think it's even possible to answer with the content of the game. Um, but I love that. I was, I was still really into that. I, yeah, I don't, I'm not leaving this podcast any more convinced one way or another. Yep. Which I think is great. I yeah. think that's awesome. It's uh it's, yeah. it's like a good film or, or television show in that it ultimately raises more questions than it answers, but the questions it does answer are really neat. So I'll probably be a completionist on this game and find all 
271 clips. Mm -hmm. I did find um, right before we started that if you move the console window over, you can look at a database checker and it'll show you how many you haven't seen yet. What? I didn't find that till late. Oh, yeah, that, that helped a lot um, when I was trying to figure out how much of it I'd seen. And I've now gotten to the point where I've seen about 80% of it. And the big thing that helps is that if you do, quote unquote, complete the game, if you let the credits roll, at the end, it gives you a couple of admin passwords to the computer. And um, one of them oh. uh, will let you jump to a random clip. Um, and another one will change the number of clips that you can see from any search term to 15. Oh. So once you complete the game, quote unquote, and let those credits roll, you learn some stuff that makes your, you know, last little while of going in and cleaning out those last clips that you didn't see a lot easier. Yeah, I'm probably at like 50%, I guess. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's hard to. Yeah, guess. it's hard to say because yeah. it doesn't really yeah. tell you. But it's. Uh, that looks I'm like at about, about 70 without the. Um, without the the admin passwords i will do the admin passwords now i didn't know that was a possibility <laughs> i was afraid the game was going to reset oh yeah you've you've probably seen more of it than i have judging by your uh, your image there i'm good at googling <laughs> and it's a it's an important skill in our modern era this was really an exciting episode and i'm really glad we got a chance to play this really cool game i really enjoyed chatting with sam barlow and um uh, and it really uh it's kind of got me pumped for our, our upcoming episodes of the short game. I'm pretty sure our next episode is going to be on contrast, which uh, came out a couple of years ago now. Um, but it's a game that I missed playing when it was new and I've been meaning to get back to. Um, it's a sort of puzzle platformer that has a visual style that is kind of a jazz agey uh, sort of cartoony style to it. Looks really exciting, and it's available for all sorts of platforms. Yeah, and the um, the folks behind that just uh, today uh, completed their Kickstarter for a game called We Happy Few, uh, which is kind of a Bioshock-looking alternate uh, England where it's the 60s, and people have to take joy pills. And if you don't take a joy pill, you're a downer, and you basically have to stealth uh, survivalist your way through a 1960s mod drugged out uh, post-war England. I saw that Kickstarter video. It looked really cool. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I think Contrast has the same, a similarly interesting visual style. It's kind of uh, kind of jazz age, but with a lot of the visual aesthetic of uh, Bioshock Infinite. So if you like that mm -hmm. look. And um, for a less hardcore audience, yeah. Definitely so, yeah. So um, an, an interesting sort of shadow mechanic. So I, we're, I'm excited to play that and talk about it on our next episode. Um, before we head out, um, what have you been up to this week, Laura? Um, I've been consuming a lot of uh, lady-centric media. I have a friend who um, just moved to town, and she's between jobs. And so um, we watched a bunch of Outlander. We did take in Magic <laughs> Mike XXL. Nice. Um, which is not sexy at all, oh. but it is very uh, much about the power of bro friendship. It is entourage for people who like women. Um mm. Because Entourage. all the men like women very, very much. And um, the only people with jobs in the entire movie are women. They have disposable income to fuel the male stripper industry. Um, <laughs> so uh, very lady-centric media, but um, a pretty good week overall. How about you, Nate? Well, I'm still trying to build this boat. Um, oh, yes. Oh, damn, I've, yes. <laughs> important. I, I started about a week behind you guys. Um, so uh, I spent a weekend down at the Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, it's just kind of a, a lake spot here in Missouri. Um, for the 4th of July, fired off a ton of fireworks, uh, burnt both of my thumbs pretty terrible as I was the maestro of the, uh, me and a buddy were the maestro of the firework display. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm glad you made that sacrifice for your country. Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, I shot a ton of fireworks off, which was great. Um, so it was pretty much between that, building this boat, and uh, for those who maybe didn't listen to last week's episode, there's a podcast. And the one before that. Yeah, and the one before that. There's a game called You Must Build a Boat, because um, that probably sounds like a like crazy people talk if you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, They've already an, sat through 20 minutes of crazy people talk. Yeah. That's fair. Uh, it's a great game, and I definitely recommend it. Um but really, that's been it. A lot of family time, uh, a lot of building this boat, and trying to figure out who killed Simon. That's pretty much been it. Yep. 
like you both, I've been building a boat on my iPhone. Um, this week was, uh, I'm still moving into my new house for the most part. So a lot of unpacking of, uh, of pictures and measuring and hanging them on walls. And, uh, Jamie and I, uh, I haven't played a lot of games this week. I played a little bit more of the Witcher three, which I'm continuing to love. And every turn it, it turns up something new that I'm really excited about. And I'm still playing a lot of persona four on my PlayStation Vita, which uh, is, you know, kind of a, a cross between an RPG and a dating sim. And uh, sounds perfect for you. It's perfect for me. It's still really long. I'm about 55 hours in and I'm, I'm not even close to the end yet, I think. So um, it's a it's a definite recommendation if you have a PlayStation Vita and like uh, RPGs. Um, but I probably won't have anything much new to talk about apart from the games we're playing for the show uh, it, because I'm playing those two super long RPGs right now, The Witcher 3 and uh, Persona 4. Thanks again for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. It's been a really exciting one. Um, I've been your host, Reagan Kelly, and uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Nate, where can people find you? You can also find me on Twitter at Nate STL. Anything to plug? Like, Nate, how's your uh, how's your baseball podcast going? Uh, pretty good. You know, we're getting into the swing of things uh, mid-season. So, uh, again, if you happen to be a fan of the St. Louis Cardinals and the sound of my voice, uh, go ahead and look for so nice. Talking About Birds. It's, uh, it's fun. We just joined a St. Louis-centric podcast network, which is pretty exciting. So pretty fancy. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, and, of course, you can follow our show on Twitter at underscore short game, or you can go to our website, www.theshortgame.net, where we've got a list of upcoming episodes or a list of things we're thinking about doing for upcoming episodes episodes. We've also got a feedback form. We'd love to hear from you about this episode or games that you're interested in hearing about. Uh, And uh, of course, uh, you can find us on iTunes where we really appreciate five star reviews. They are the currency in which you pay for the podcasts that you listen to. Leave those five star reviews with all five glittering gold stars and the podcast gods will shine down upon you. Um, So do that. And uh, thanks so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Oh, right. After, after this music, you'll be hearing a little bit more from Sam Barlow, off topic, but really interesting, talking about his favorite crime fiction and police interviews that he came, came across while, uh, um, while researching. So stick around for that if you're interested. Well, one last question for you, I guess, and that's, uh, is there any question that you, you know, you've been doing a lot of press recently. Is there any question that you wish you'd been asked more often or anything that, uh, anything that you have now decided you hate being asked? Uh, there was two questions that I haven't been asked that I thought I would be asked and so I had prepared answers for. And then they were, what, uh, to, to recommend a, a crime fiction novel um, or my favorite crime fiction story, and also being asked what is my favorite police interview, mm-hmm. and uh, no one has asked me that. Well, please do answer. Ah, so uh, <laughs> so the 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 crime fiction that I wanted to recommend was there's a, a book I read a few years ago called um, The Devotion of Suspect X, um, which is written by a Japanese um, writer and was only recently translated, I believe, but it was a big hit in Japan. Um, and I loved that story because it's, it's a Columbo style story. Um, so one of the things that interested me about her story was if you analyze the kind of the, the crime story, you can break it down into this, the kind of whodunits where you have a mystery and then it, you know, the, the whole story is about solving that mystery. You have what I guess is now commonly called the Columbo, which is, you know, what happened and who did it. Um, and in most cases you kind of know how they did it. And then it's the story is, watching the detective catch up with them what was the mistake they made whatever um and those tend to be quite interesting to a modern audience because you know the, the traditional audience you were very much on the side of the detective and things were, were kind of very clear and um you know there was a, a set of rules to these things but yeah the kind of Columbo style thing now you there's a lot more suspense in that um you know the, the shifts in perspective are very interesting um and then you have even more modern is the kind of the why done it where actually the specifics of the crime are less interesting and it's much more about the psychology and the characters and just understanding the reasons. 
um, behind why they've done these crimes. And it's, you know, it's a much more sophisticated kind of modern take. And, you know, a lot of modern TV crime shows are very much about that. You know, they throw away a lot of the kind of cliched aspects to detective stories and they much more become essentially kind of character pieces. Um, and, you know, they might, have, they might kind of play lip service to the mystery or kind of throw the mystery out, you know, halfway through their series or whatever, but then they get very focused on the characters. Um, and um, what I love about uh, Devotion Suspect X is it's, it's kind of a Columbo-style story. So, uh, you know, within the first few pages, I think, um, you know who um, committed the crime and why they did it. Um, and the, the story is then how they get away with it. Hmm. But it has this ending which just blew me away because the ending, it's a very clever piece of plotting, which is always very satisfying, you know, in, in a kind of crime story. But the kind of character insight that this revelation in the ending grants you is just so powerful and wonderful for me that it, it just, you know, for me that became a very powerful uh, piece of writing because it, it managed to kind of c- combine and synthesize this very specific kind of, you know, the plot twist and the, the kind of plot revelation with a very deep insight into the character. And that's kind of such a holy grail um, with writing for me that that kind of blew me away. So I would recommend The Devotion of Suspect X as uh, a, a really strong piece of crime writing. Um, and my favorite police interview, um, I, so I, th- I thought about this, and the one that kept coming to mind um, was there's and it's it's not from a um well, it's not directly from a, a kind of murder investigation but there's an interview that um Tupac Shakur gives with the police um and it's when he was being accused of having incited people to um commit crime with his lyrics hmm. um you know, a series of cases where he was being sued because of an attack on a police officer and the i can't remember if the police officer was killed or not but the you know there was some sort of attack on on the police and his his music was blamed for it and um you know you've never seen someone come across quite so intelligent and considered and um one, one of the keys when i was reading up on police interview techniques was the idea that as the person being interviewed, as the accused, it's so important to maintain a relationship with the policeman that isn't adversarial. Um, so, that, you know, the, you can very quickly kind of shut things down and, and become difficult, but that can create problems. And some of the best examples of, of really um, chilling police interviews are with um, particularly violent criminals who because of their kind of because they are these kind of sociopaths um they have quite a lot of skill with with some of their kind of personal interactions and there are people like um like the serial killer harold shipman was a master of of being interviewed by the police and managing to answer their questions without incriminating himself but without being difficult and and kind of creating this friction with the interview um but yeah when you when you see uh, tupac being interviewed um by these detectives who are, you know, be, you know, accusing him and, and trying to trick him and trap him, he doesn't lose his cool. He appears very warm and genuine, and is just so composed. Um, it's, it's quite impressive, and you know, he he gets into uh, how he sees his his music as being essentially poetry and and sort of refuses to kind of categorize it as gangster rap. And he's just, it's, it's fascinating to watch because I think the, the thing that detectives fear the most is having someone sat opposite them who's cleverer than them, hmm. which very rarely happens because, you know, 99% of crime is committed by people who are not as smart as the detectives. Um, and, you know, that's, that's almost like a cliche of, uh, of crime fiction is the idea of the master detective, the master criminal, sorry. Um, but, yeah, just this sense of... of of, of his dignity and his intelligence in that scenario. I think that that's what my brain clings to because having gone through hundreds of hours of this stuff as research, it, you know, there's a sense of it just you feel um, 
slightly dirty afterwards because there's so much human suffering and um, and kind of sadness in all these interviews. Um, and and often you feel like the detective is is taking liberties, is you know um, kind of violating this kind of a lot of kind of social norms and, and getting people to talk about things that are very intimate and, and kind of deep for them. So yeah, the, as a, as a kind of counterpoint to that, that, that particular interview, um, which I think is on YouTube, if people want to go and see it, um, is, is much nicer to watch. Awesome. 